Mike James here with Armor of God on the web. Thanks for joining us today. What I'm going to talk about today is a criticism that people have about the Bible or the God of the Bible. Some people think that God allows slavery, that He wanted slavery. And again, that's just not the case when you understand what the law of God is really saying about slavery in the Old Testament, and that's what we're going to focus on today. Now again, when we think of slavery in the Old Testament, we've got to remember that it isn't exactly like slavery that you're familiar with in the Old South. And I'm going to show you some things right from the law of God that make that clear today. Now let's begin over in Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus chapter 25, and I'm going to pick it up there in verse 44 of Leviticus 25. Now listen to what it says there. Leviticus 25, 44, Both thy bondmen and thy bondmaids, again, this is the King James Version, so this is talking about slaves, men slaves and women slaves, which thou shalt have, shall be of the heathen, that are round about you. Of them shall you buy bondmen and bondmaids. Moreover, of the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you, of them shall you buy, and of their families that are with you, which they begat in your land, and they shall be your possession. And you shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them for a possession. They shall be your bondmen forever. But over your brethren, the children of Israel, you shall not rule one over another with rigor. Now what is this saying? God allowed slavery in ancient Israel as long as you bought slaves from the surrounding peoples, from the heathen who were around Israel. God did not allow the Israelites who were under His theocracy to be in the slave trade that was taking place in Israel at this time. There's a distinction between who is a slave that is your possession it could be the heathen around you who did not believe in God, did not follow God, but you could not do that with the Israelites that were living among you. So that's an important distinction right from the get-go to understand. Again, understand God is taking into account the cultural milieu that was extant at this time in history. There's a law of God dealing with polygamy, not because God wanted polygamy. We know in the New Testament that Jesus Christ said there should be one man and one woman in marriage, but the culture at that time when God gave the law, that particular thing was going on. So again, there are so many things to understand when you get into the law of God to make it clear for you. But let's take a look at some other scriptures in the law of God pertaining to this subject. Numbers chapter 15. I'm going to pick it up there. Or I should say Deuteronomy chapter 15. Deuteronomy chapter 15 and I'll begin reading there over in verse 11 and I'm going to be reading about something else that sometimes is associated with slavery, but this isn't slavery per se. In Deuteronomy chapter 15 and verse 11, listen to what we read about here. Deuteronomy 15, 11. And if thy brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, be sold unto you. Now that means that a Hebrew could sell themselves to you because of their financial or economic situation and serve you six years then in the seventh year they shall let him go free from thee. And when you sendest him out free from you, thou shalt not let him go away empty. You shall furnish him liberally out of thy flock, and out of the floor, and out of the winepress of that wherewithal the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, thou shalt give unto him. And thou shalt remember that you were a bondman in the land of Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Therefore I command thee this thing today. And it shall be, if he say unto you, I will not go away from thee, because he loveth thee, and thine house, because he is well with thee, then you shall take an awl, and thrust it through his ear under the door, and he shall be thy servant forever, and also unto the maidservant thou shalt do likewise. So here's a different thing going on with Israelites. 
If they were poor, if they were destitute, if they were indebted to other Israelites, they could work off that debt. They could build themselves back up. This was kind of a welfare system within Israel. And after six years, they are released. And they go and you give them extra things when they go on their way. This is a great welfare system in Israel. God was taking care of His people who were going to be poor. There are going to be poor people everywhere all the time. This was a great remedy for that situation that we see here in God's law. Now let's get back to the slaves that we were talking about earlier, the people who were under the possession of Israelites, and I want to show you that they were under God's law. So you could not treat a slave like some slaves were treated in the South during the North American slave trade. The atrocities that were committed against those slaves could not be committed in Israel because they were all under God's law. And that's a fact that we will see. Let's take a look at Numbers chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15, and I'm going to pick it up there, beginning in verse 29 of Numbers 15. Listen to what we read here, Numbers 15, 29. You shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance, both for him that is born among the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. But the soul that doeth aught presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the stain reproaches the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people. So we hear from God's law that everybody's under the same law in the land of Israel. And notice this in Exodus. In Exodus, dealing with one of the big uh, holy day seasons for the Israelites, Exodus chapter 12, get this, in Exodus 12, beginning in verse 43. Exodus 12, beginning in verse 43. It says this, And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. Again, making a distinction between those who are Israelites and those who are not. But verse 44, But every man's servant that is bought for money, this could be a slave, folks, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall you break a bone thereof. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover of the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and let them come near and keep it, and it shall be as one that is born in the land. For no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. One law shall be to him that is homeborn, and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. What are the implications of this? The implications are that, wait a minute, if someone was a slave, and let's say during their time they decided, hey, I believe in this God. I want to follow this God. If he was circumcised, what happens, folks? He becomes part of Israel. There are other laws that get into that, okay? I'm just giving you one example here. So it's possible that slaves could have become Israelites over time if they wanted to change their religion. They got circumcised. And again, they would have to follow God's law. That would be the point. Now, let's take a look at another example over in Leviticus 16.29, just to provide further proof of the fact that everybody was under the same law, so even the slaves had to be treated correctly under God's law. You just couldn't go beating someone. You just couldn't go uh, committing torture and atrocities on someone as we did have during the North American slave trade. In Leviticus 16 and verse 29, let me pick it up there. Here's what we read, Leviticus 16 and verse 29. And this shall be a statute forever among you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you will afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one in your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. There again, they had to take part in this. And Exodus chapter 20 and verse 10, you've probably all read that particular scripture in relation to God's Sabbath commandment, but let's take a closer look at it with the backdrop of what we're discussing today. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 10, and let me begin there. 
verse 10, Exodus 20, But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor the cat, thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gate. Again, showing you that God's law was over everyone in the land of Israel. They had to abide by it. And here, manservant and maidservant, the same word is used for bondmen and bondwoman that we read earlier, which meant slave. It's talking about your slaves here in the land of Israel. They get off on the Sabbath also, again, to uh, further that point that I was making. So again, let's look at now some of the punishments that could be meted out because some of the critics say, well, it looks like God's law is allowing uh, Israel to punish slaves severely. And they come up with that based on Exodus chapter 21. So let me turn over there to give you some further information on this. Exodus chapter 21 and verse 20. Listen to what it says. And if a man smite his servant or his maid with a rod and he die under his hand, he shall be surely punished. Notwithstanding, if he continues a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he is his money. Now this is definitely talking about slaves. Now, now you might say, oh, you could just punish your slave. No, no, think about this for a minute. This is saying if you punish your slave and he did die, you're going to be punished. So it is a, 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 uh, a way for people to realize when they have slaves, i got to treat my slave under God's law because I could be punished if I punish him severely and he dies. So this would be a way to stop people from severely punishing their slaves because they knew that they could be punished. As it says there in verse 20, he shall be severely punished, meaning the slave owner. Now what kind of punishment could you receive for killing someone? Well, we can look in this uh, chapter back in verse 12 and 13 and notice what it says there. He that smiteth a man so that he die shall be surely put to death. And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. So again, there were different categories of murder. If you were, were setting out to kill your slave and you did, you could suffer the death penalty. If it was an accident because the slave had done something wrong, and slaves could do something wrong, and they could be punished for that, but if you went too far with it, you could commit involuntary manslaughter or something like that. And then there was a punishment for that. But it was all under God's law, and that was a protection to the slaves. Again, we've got to understand the context in which we're reading this. And to, to provide further proof, as we drop down in the same chapter of Exodus chapter 21, notice verse 26. And if a man smite the eye of his servant, speaking of a slave, or the eye of his maid, meaning a slave woman, that it perish, he shall let him go free for his eye's sake. And if he smite out his manservant's tooth, or his maidservant's tooth, he shall let him go free for his tooth's sake. Slaves could go free if you punish them incorrectly, and it wasn't the type of punishment that you should be meting out on them. If you harm them in some way, as this is stating, they could go free. And again, that would cost you economically, so obviously I don't think people would want to punish their slaves in that manner. Now again, as we get to the New Testament, we see in the book of Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28 that there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither male nor female, there's neither bond nor free once we all come in communion with Jesus Christ. When we become spirit beings, God does not want slavery. That's not going to be part of the system when everything is put in order by God. But we know that when we read the New Testament. But the Roman times had slaves. There's nothing that they could do about it 
at that time. Folks, I want you to learn more about the law of God. Please ask for which Old Testament laws apply today. You can get it at our website at cgi.org, download it from our literature list, or send us an email to info at cgi.org to get that important pamphlet so you can better understand God's law so you don't have these false ideas about what God is saying within His law. Also, I'd like you to get our CGI digital network app. It is free. All you need to do is download it from your Google, Amazon, or Apple app stores free of charge. Thank you so much for joining us today on Armor of God on the Web. So long for now. The Church of God International would like to introduce the availability of a new app designed for your convenience. Download it now 